Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today is the last episode of 2022 year, and I, for one, want to thank everyone for tuning in to hear these entrepreneurial stories. If you have enjoyed the show so far, then here are a few ways to help support the show. Stream the Shades of Entrepreneurship, the podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and leave a pleasant review. Two, subscribe to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, the newsletter, by visiting theshadesofe.com. Three, follow the Shades of E on social media, at the Shades of E, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Four, support and follow our entrepreneurial guests. I encourage each individual to provide their information at the end of the show. Please follow them. Five, shameless plug time. Creatively Insane, the parent company of the Shades of Entrepreneurship, has been working with local artists to bring creative limited edition items. Part of the revenue from the sales goes directly to the artists, and the other revenue helps to continue to support the Shades of Entrepreneurship, the podcast, the newsletter, and other collaborative endeavors. The Shades of Entrepreneurship, the brand, is philanthropic work. The brand aims to give back to our community by giving our community a platform to showcase their wares, to speak their ideas, and to promote their art and talent. Latinx Founders, the nonprofit I helped recently create, is also philanthropic work, and the goal is to help support our entrepreneurs. That is what I do. I help connect people with other people. As we end the year, I am forever thankful to each and every one of you for listening in, to the entrepreneurs and artists for allowing us to peer into their lives, and to those that have taken the time to teach me, collaborate with me, and share knowledge with me. After all, I am just an entrepreneur in a globe of entrepreneurs. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Did a general surgery internship at Stanford University before following her passion for performance science, where the fields of strategy, productivity, and psychology intersect. Please welcome the founder of Faxi, Carla Fowler. This episode is sponsored in part by Burnside Knives, essential tools for outdoor enthusiasts and working professionals like yourself. Visit BurnsideKnives.com. Your knife says a lot about you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I am here with Carla Fowler, the founder and managing director at Thaxa. Carla, how are we doing? I'm doing great, Gabriel. Thanks for having me. Because this this is a unique, unique business um, kind of endeavor. This is actually about executive coaching and kind of actually helping support others. But first, before we get into all that, let's introduce the world to Carla. Carla, give us a little background. All right. Uh, Well, I grew up in the Seattle area, uh, middle child of three kids, and um, Just in terms of like my background and sort of career path, I uh, was always into math and science. I think I really liked understanding how things worked. And um, I also have always been an athlete of sorts. Uh, I just really love movement. I love learning new skills. I did a year of like diving in the middle of everything. I mean, like high dive, low dive, you know, these are the things I just really always was very curious about. Um, whether it was a sport or even learning to do your multiplication tables, like how do you just learn how to do things? If you want to be good at something, like how do you do that? (laughs) Um, So loved those new experiences. And um, so educationally, I uh, went to Brown University, uh, got a degree in human biology, and then ultimately was accepted to uh, what was called a medical scientist training program. And uh, that was at University of Washington. And basically it is the double stuffed Oreo of like academic medicine and science. So you do like two years of med school, 
you go get a PhD in a biological science, then you go back and you finish your clinical years of med school, and then you're off to residency. So uh -huh. um, took about nine years. Um, I spent most of my 20s either playing ultimate frisbee or uh, <laughs> uh, you know cramming for tests or in the lab, like pulling all-nighters in the lab. And uh, so I went off to Stanford to do a general surgery residency. And I'll tell you, uh, within about the first year of what was going to be five, uh, I made a dramatic pivot. Um, and that was the moment when uh, my executive coaching firm was founded. So uh, that is not typically how people get into the industry that I am in, but that was sort of my pathway. I love it. Now, before we get into Thaxa, I got to ask, like, okay, this is, this is a very interesting, you're going down the general surgery. Now, for those folks at home, you, you kind of got to get through a lot of education before you even get to the residency of general surgery. So what, what kind of made you decide that first year to pivot? Well, I think the first thing that's really important is I always did stuff that I was interested in and, but maybe people will resonate with this. I'm interested in a lot of stuff. And in particular, I love challenging things. I love doing something hard, trying to figure out how to do it. And, um, I definitely picked surgery because it linked up somewhat with my research interests. So I was thinking I might be a transplant surgeon or potentially do surgical oncology. But uh, ultimately, one of the things I really liked about surgery was uh, that the surgeons have this knack and almost a requirement for uh, seeing, owning, and then improving their choices. So the decision to operate on someone or not is so binary. And a lot of medicine is not as binary as that. Um, you know, you can give a medication, you can try it out, you can see if it works, you can see how someone tolerates it. If it's not good, you stop. But in surgery, I mean, you're going to take someone to the operating room, get them all set up and like cut into them. Yeah. And that's a big deal. And I really liked what that meant about how surgeons had to think about decision making and the choices. And usually you have imperfect data. And if there are any entrepreneurs out there that are thinking to themselves, wow, that sounds like my life, uh, you know, having to make what is a high stakes decision <laughs> true. with imperfect data, uh, there are a ton of similarities. And, um, but that was what kind of brought me into surgery. And I really liked that. And I still loved that it was a very high performing environment where there were high stakes and lots of things to learn. But you know, in, in life, there are a lot of trade-offs that we have to think about. And one of the biggest things is our time and our work is one of the things that will ultimately take up the most time that we have. And if it wasn't clear for me, sort of talking about the portfolio of things that I was doing growing up, I think for me, one of the important things was that I wanted a multifaceted life. Um, and um, that is not to say that one could not have that in surgery, but there are some brutal time equation elements for what's possible and what's not. And um, I think for me, looking around, I could imagine being interested in something other than operating, uh, but I couldn't imagine really focusing my life to go that deep on that one thing without the ability to be an athlete outside of that or do some of the other things I was interested in. You know, one of the things you mentioned uh, in, in regards to like surgery, and I think this is, it's very true for a lot of listeners to hear is perfection's impossible to obtain, right? And in surgery, in healthcare in general, I think for the last couple of years, there's been some distrust in the healthcare world for various reasons. And, and I think it's important for individuals to understand healthcare, we're not trying to make the perfect choice. We're trying to make the best choice possible because we don't know what the perfect choice is. Uh, your, yeah. your anatomy may react differently to some medications than mm -hmm. others. Your body may react differently to surgery. You may not be ready for a transplant. You know, and these are things that mm -hmm. our providers constantly are having to go through. In fact, they're things called tumor boards for, for the oncology world in particular, right? Um, yeah. You know, if you're a surgical oncologist, you're going through a tumor board. There's a general surgeon. There's a surgical oncologist, radiation, pulmonology, imaging, all these providers talking about just you. So, so entrepreneurs, when you're out there thinking about, you know, perfection and you're seeing these social media channels that are perfectly curated to spark an interest, 
there's probably a lot of money and marketing behind those perfectly curated, you know, things. So, so you kind of dispel the uh, notion that perfection is obtainable because it's not, um, try to do what's best, you know, what, whatever the best outcome is. Uh, and that's even true in business. Uh, and same thing we do in healthcare, right? We, we try to find what's the best possible outcome, not the perfect outcome because we're unsure what the perfect is, but we're, we're certainly trying to aim as close to perfection as possible. Now, now, one of the things you mentioned, you know, that kind of helped spark this new business. Uh, let's talk about what is your company? So Thaxa is an elite level executive coaching firm, and it was born out of both my passion for uh, loving these high performing environments, loving thinking about performance, and thinking that that was actually something that I could stay interested in for a lifetime. Uh, so that piece. And then I think a second piece of me is just that I love the pursuit of things. And the truth is, I believe everyone loves being good at things. I think we let a lot of things get in the way um, or talk ourselves out of it or all of these things. But I think all of us feel great when we feel like we're performing at our best. And I just have this empathy or this desire to like give that to other people, to help other people figure out what's going to work for them, particularly when they're doing these really challenging things where the feedback loops aren't perfect, you get imperfect data, perfection is not obtainable. Um, I just thought, I, I think I, I had been coaching for about two decades informally in the sense of that's just how I think about the world. And I love to help people around me. So 10 years ago was sort of the formal start of Thaxa as a concept. And I really built it around kind of tying into my scientific background, this idea that actually we have science and knowledge about this stuff. And also the idea that most people who go into coaching actually don't have my background. And so in that sense, I love combining sort of a different lens, a different background in a new industry to see what happens, to build something great that's different than what's already out there. So that was sort of the inspiration for Thaxa as a concept. And so how, what was your like kind of aha moment? You know, you're going through general surgery residency and decide, you know what, this is not the career path I should be going down. Executive coaching is the career path I should be doing. I don't think I had exactly the sort of niche of like, oh, it's executive coaching. But what I will say is, uh, I think I, when you're starting to think about like, okay, this thing is not my thing, then, you know, you sort of have to decide like, okay, well, what's, what's not a good fit about it? And in some ways, the high performance stuff was a great fit, but I realized I needed more autonomy. I wanted to have control of my time because uh, in the performance world, one of the things that I think is most important is how do we use our time? So how do we think about our time? How do we use our time really potently? And also, how do we feel about it? And I think one of the other things I definitely noticed was I was so underslept. I mean, I was an intern. I was a surgical uh, intern. I was so underslept and we know like that uh, sleep deprivation is really terrible for our brains and our health. And um, it actually took me about three months of catching up on sleep before I felt like I had a creative thought again, to be wow. perfectly honest, like a, a non necessity, like do this, do this, do this kind of thought. And, um, and so I think, you know, you start to notice these things and then you start to say, okay, I need a different plan. And I actually had an attending who I looked up to and I respected, a um, very kind person who surprised me one day very early and said, Carla, what's your plan? And I think I said something like, oh, la, 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 like I'm going to, I transplant surgery, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, no, he's like, what's your plan? He's like, my plan is to build an app. I want to be more independent so that I can operate when and where I want, like more or less like the plan to sort of get out. Right. right. And when someone you look up to asks you that question, you start to think like, oh, I, I need a plan. Like I need to actually think about whether or not this is going to work. And, um, and so that was actually pretty good advice for me. And nine months later, I had figured out that I was sort of moving forwards. I, um, you know, made sure they had plenty of notice um, and a really wonderful friend um, took the spot that I had and um, is a fabulous surgeon. 
And uh, then I knew that I wanted to do some kind of coaching to work on it with performance science and to really integrate those two things into a firm. So those are some of the moments, some of the key things that said, okay, it's not this, but it is about performance and it is about working with people. So, yeah. I like it. In fact, uh, shout out to the fabulous friend that's a surgeon. If you're looking for a role, please look me up at OHSU. I'm happy to always chat with surgeons that are looking for some positions in the healthcare world because we're always looking for some new surgeons. Now, how, awesome. now, let's talk about VAXA a little bit and like, how did you, how did you financially? Because is this your first, first is this your first entrepreneurial endeavor? Well, technically, my first entrepreneurial endeavor was a card business that I sold out of a wagon when I was <laughs> like eight. <laughs> Gotta hear about this. Oh, well, I mean, there's not much to tell, except <laughs> that uh, I already had an understanding of like, it's good to go into an industry where you can have a high margin product. I think my mom was appalled at what I had said I was going to charge for these greeting cards. <laughs> anyway, so that, <laughs> that was short lived. That was probably like a two afternoon business. Oh, well, no, were these like handmade cards that you made? Oh, yeah, totally. Oh. Yeah. And just cruising Glitter. around the wagon. Uh-huh. See, yeah, lots of... Glitter, sparkles. Mm -hmm. That's just hustling. That's just grassroots right? hustling right there. Now, what about <laughs> financing? How did you kind of start the, the finance route? Is this kind of grassroots efforts, Daxa? So I self-funded. And um, a big piece of that that was fortunate was I, I my training had been a funded program. So I didn't have student debt, which is was just a huge gift for me. Yeah. So um, that was very helpful. And one of the things when you think about self-funding and how I thought about self-funding was it was really an investment in myself and building the career that I could see lasting, you know, the next 40 years and something that I would love that would have a lot of optionality to take it where I wanted to go. And then it was a platform. And so that was something worth investing in. Uh, certainly coaching doesn't have the same kinds of capital uh, types of things you might need to start a different kind of business. Right. So, right. Yeah, that's how I funded. So let's let's kind of talk about the because obviously you have to scale up your business, right? And you have to get new clientele. How did you get your first client? How did you kind of begin to? How did you create the business essentially? Well, I got my wagon and I put some materials. In I it. love it. No, cars. I'm just I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I. Uh, you know, the way I started and got my first clients and also just gathered a lot of data and learning, because again, they don't teach you to sell in medical school. They no, don't they do not. teach you a lot about running a business or setting up a business. And um, so I hustled and did a ton of networking. And this was helpful for a couple of reasons. Number one, like I was coming back to Seattle from Palo Alto. And so just kind of reestablishing myself in the community. One important thing I think about coaching is that it, um, perhaps not unlike other types of service providers, but it is a business where trust is really important. And this sense of like knowing a person uh, is, is important, particularly if you are newer and um, haven't been coaching for as long. And so I think networking was really helpful for me. And when I say networking, I really just mean really relationship building. I had coffee with many, many people and I'm very interested in people and I'm interested in what they're up to, uh, what their goals are. And um, as a part of that, you get to share, what are you doing? You know, what is your business? But it really was, I want to be very clear. There was very little like go to a large gathering, do the business card swap about. Um, it was very much like Build relationships. Um, if there are organizations you're interested in, join them, be a part of them so that people just get a sense of who you are as a person. Um, because then the idea of like working one on one with you becomes uh, much more tangible. And there's a little bit of that baseline trust there when someone realizes that actually they do want to coach or need a coach. They have someone to call. Even if it's not me, they have a starting point. Yeah. And let, let's talk about that. You know, I think I've highlighted, high, I've highlighted this many of times, um, the importance of networking uh, for you, you know, being a new entrepreneur, what would, how important would you say networking has been to your success as far? It was very important to my success. That being said, I think there are different, there are different methods of building a business 
And it kind of depends what the business is. My business is very humanistic. And so in that sense, um, I think that you need pe- to give people a chance to get to know you. And for me, when I looked at kind of a pipeline and the idea of building a clientele, it just made the most sense to do that in person. I also think, again, part of the desire to go into coaching are some strengths around just having a conversation, listening, um, you know, being able to do that. And so um, I am actually an introvert, but one-on-one conversations are really my sweet spot. And so for me, networking made a ton of sense, assuming I was doing coffee by coffee and not, you know, large ballroom uh, filled with people. So um, that made a lot of sense for me and for my business. Um, Other ways that people do go about it is uh, they share themselves and they share their ideas through blogging or some other types of channels like that. And I think that can be effective. You know, I looked at what I thought I would most enjoy doing and what I thought would be most effective. And for me, it was like, don't start blogging right now. In fact, (laughs) I did no social media for the first 10 years of my practice. Um, And, uh, and that was fine because you need to be out doing stuff. You don't necessarily need to be doing what everyone else is doing as long as what you're doing is effective. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great, in fact, you you mentioned you're an introvert. How, what advice would you give to other introverts? Cause there's a lot of entrepreneurs, extroverts and introverts are, there's no, uh, kind of dissemination in that regard. Now, what would, what advice would you give? Like, what are some things that you did to kind of overcome mm-hmm. this? Cause you're kind of going out and met, meeting with people and you're kind of putting yourself out there to grow your business. What advice would you give another introvert that might be thinking of becoming an entrepreneur? Mm-hmm. I would say it's okay if you're terrified. I mean, like the first time I was out trying to sort of pitch my concept and how I was working, it wasn't just sort of bread and butter executive coaching. And so I was trying to explain it. And, um, you know, you have all these ideas about what other people are thinking, but I just say, keep going, get started. Don't worry if you feel terrified, you will only get better. And also remember everyone else is terrified too. Oh yes. I mean, everyone, we are so (laughs) self-centered. on our own insecurities. And so that's just helpful to remember, but I, I really, so in my practice, one of the things I'll talk about is like 90, 90, 90. Uh, the most important thing about the 90, 90, 90 tip is number one, get started. That will put you in the top 10%, like, cause 90% of people often just don't get started on what they're doing. Second 90, keep going. So even after you have a terrible coffee or whatever it is, like, I just, I had scheduled them. I forced myself to send the emails, do the outreach. And I was like, you need to go to that coffee. And you go and then you have some great coffees and, you know, some in the middle. And the truth is you just got to keep going. And then the last 90 is you need to then start to think about, okay, how could I improve this a little bit? What was confusing about my pitch to that last person? Or what were the questions they asked? And what could I learn about? you know, what's working effectively and what's not based on what they asked about or what their concerns were. And so that last 90 is all about then uh, looping or iterating and just making a little bit of improvement every time. And this is more or less how great stuff happens. I think sometimes we think, oh no, someone's just talented and it just happens. The truth is, this is a very effective way of improving and it's how most improvement actually happens. Yeah. It's, it's, that's so, so true. So folks at home, you know, I, I know a lot of people know I do a lot of public speaking. I've probably been public speaking now for a little over 15 years and I have definitely been on some times where I'm like, I should stop speaking in public because I've just bombed this. I forgot the presentation and I should have stopped right there, but I continued to go. And, and, you know, to your point, Carla, what I was really focusing on is how do I continuously improve? How do I continue to provide value back to the listeners that are attending these presentations? And now this year, I would say in the last two years in particular, maybe three, you know, this, this 15 years, now this last three, I think people are probably realizing, oh, I've been a public speaker, but I actually been doing it for, you know, 12 years before this. It's just mm-hmm. the last three years that it's finally been, you know, grabbing traction that people are actually reaching out to me and offering me, you know, honorariums and flying me out to different locations to speak on things that I've have experience in. You know, I'm not just you know, pardon my French, I'm not pulling shit out of my ass. Like I'm speaking on things I am an expert in 
if you want to talk about healthcare strategy and healthcare outreach, you want to talk about building a program using referral volume or claims data, come talk to me. You want to talk to me about reading a podcast? Come talk to me. If you want to talk to me about remodeling a bathroom, I will help you and I will never remodel it again though because that was the worst experience <laughs> of my life That's awesome. but but you know there's but then there's other things i just can't teach about you know if you want to learn how to bake i i can't i can't help you i i burn water i'm not even sure how it's possible but i do it you know and so there's just some things in but to your point carla none of this happens overnight uh mm-hmm. it's it's takes some time it's okay to be fearful of new things but at the end of the day the only way you're going to grow professionally is you have to get outside of your comfort zone. That's the, where the real growth happens. Uh, I, I, I equate it to actually traveling outside the country. If you've ever traveled outside the country, I've done a few different trips outside the country and the sense of being completely lost when you enter a new country is actually quite gratifying in the end because you grow so much because of that trip. Cause you're going to have to figure out how to get food. You're going to have to figure out where you're going to say, but you don't know that language, right? But you're going to have to learn it. You're going to have to learn things on the fly. And that's why I think I always encourage folks to travel outside the country because that's where you begin to grow a lot. You begin to mm-hmm. learn other ethnicities, you get other cultures, but personally yourself, you also grow because you put yourself in situations that you're not normally used to, right? Uh, and it's just the experience piece. Now, what would you say, you know, you're, you're, you mentioned you're an introvert, you're networking, what has been difficult about starting this business in your perspective? I would say the thing that was probably the most difficult was making that transition from, I'll just call them systems. So like, if you want to become a doctor, I mean, there are well-laid train tracks. I mean, it's it's not easy. you got to work for no, it, not, but like. Got to make it easier <laughs> a little bit because we have too many doctors like just saying this is too much. <laughs> <You know? laughs> But like, it's pretty well defined. Like what's the bar you need to meet? What do you need to do? What's the next step? How do you do that? And um, I would say that growing up, I was very good within a system. So it's like, tell me what the parameters are, the constraints are, how am I going to be measured? Okay, great. And then I would figure out how I was going to do that. So one of the hardest things that I think is really, and this is true of all entrepreneurship, is when you maybe take that leap from a system into saying, I am the system, whatever systems I make for myself, I will have. And whatever I define explicitly will give me more clarity, but I have to do all of that. There's no kind of outside party that's really going to do that. And so I think I'm a person who could see all the different things that maybe I should be good at, or that I should be doing more of, or this or that. And so I think, um, one of the challenges for me and, um, I would argue one of the challenges for most of my clients really comes back to um, defining explicitly what do you want to have happen? What is the result you're trying to produce? And then secondly, what is most important for that? I call this the brutal, this is the brutal focus of FAXA. So that's one of my like, principles of performance is um, what if you think you have to be good at everything, if everything has to be perfect, it slows you down. And also it generally means that your time gets soaked up with a bunch of stuff um, that uh, may or may not be important, but the really important stuff then doesn't get above threshold. You can't invest enough in it to really be successful at those things. And so um, I am not, I don't somehow have magic, you know, other than my, that my clients don't have, I have to do it. It is a thing I continually have to do. And I think it's one of the best things that entrepreneurs can do is to continue to think about and focus, what is it I want? Whether it's in a particular conversation or negotiation or sort of more the meta arc of your company. Yeah, and what would you say, has there, uh, would you say there's any anything been easy about this process, about starting your own business? I think I have a lot of enthusiasm and a natural curiosity for people. And I just love high performance and I could talk about it all day. And so I think for me, the spark and the desire that is what produces the value for clients was always there. That, that part was not going to be hard. I've gotten better. I've worked to improve that. So not just rely on kind of whatever natural talent I have, but really say, no, how do you hone this as a profession? How do you make it better? But that, um, 
came pretty naturally, I think. And so that's probably, and I, and I think if you're going to design your own business, find that thing because you don't, there will be things that will be a slog and you might as well build it around something that has enough of that fuel. I call it like the clean energy. It's like the solar power, the wind power versus like fueling yourself with coal or gasoline. Definitely. definitely. You know, I mean, gasoline will take you there. Coal <laughs> will take you there, but it's got a lot of byproducts that are really not that great. <laughs> yep. and, and you know, one of the things you mentioned was your enthusiasm and I can, I can see it over the, the interview right now. I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm holding myself back from recruiting you back to surgical oncology right now. Like, we, come back to Surgeon. We'll take you. Uh, you want to do some liver transplants? <laughs> what do you want to do? Oh goodness. <laughs> <laughs> now, what would you say? Well, thank you. What would what would you say kind of keeps you up at night as a small business owner currently? I'll be honest. Um, I sleep pretty well. I I have this like aura <laughs> ring <laughs> that tracks my sleep. <laughs> I, I'm like a champion sleeper. Like I can't nap. I can't nap at all during can't the day. Nap. I sleep yeah. at night very, very well. But I think the the bigger point to your question is that honestly, uh, compared to surgery, like compared to like the one year I spent as an intern, like there just aren't things I, like, I don't wake up in the middle of the night worried that my patient is dying. And I'll just be honest or worried that an attending yeah. is going to call me in the middle of the night and be like, why did you do X, Y, and Z? <laughs> uh, and I think that, um, you know, that's not to say I don't have worries. It doesn't mean that I don't sort of like have something and perseverate on it. But I think one of the things that really helps me is just that perspective of saying like, gosh, at the end of the day, like if I get sick in the middle of the night, I can go to the hospital. Like there are these amazing people there to take care of me. And in my business, there isn't really anything that's life or death. And, um, you know, we do the best we can and sure there will be decisions or things that don't turn out well, but in the grand scheme of things, uh, there, there aren't things that are kind of like career ending or life ending or like those big, big things. And, um, you know, I say that and who knows, I may just not have discovered them yet, but I also find it's not generally very productive for me to like worry or perseverate about that. You kind of got to take things as they come. And I think this is very true for the entrepreneurs out there that, um, there could be a lot of like gear spinning or, um, basically like energy that you put out. That's not productive. Um, just worrying versus if something needs a plan, or if something, if there's some homework you could do to figure something out so you wouldn't worry about it, awesome, do that. But there are some things that are unknowable. There's some things that are just going to be uncertain and no amount of research are going to um, take care of that for you. And that's why another one of my like principles is we got to learn to relish the uncertainty and even to have a sense of like, fun about it. I I don't know if that's the right word, but because the uncertainty is also where things can surprise and delight us. And it's also where the opportunity is. And we have to take that risk for, yeah, it might not turn out how we want, but our lives will often feel a lot more flat if we're unwilling to take that risk, whether it's to grow and have that networking coffee, if it's to start that business, that is the thing that you see that um, no one else sees, but you know, it can be great. Like, yeah. Makes things interesting. No, and it's a great point because, you know, healthcare provides such a unique perspective on life um, mm-hmm. and the fortunes that I think people that aren't in, you know, have that experience uh, probably don't really understand it as much. Maybe people that have like a life and death experience, maybe somebody has gone through cancer or things like that nature, they can definitely relate. But, you know, I've interviewed a lot of entrepreneurs and there are times, you know, I think you nailed it, Carla, is like, understanding that this is not a life or death situation. Um, Money's going to come and go. Even if you, I've had some entrepreneurs on the show that have been dead broke and they've risen through the fire like a Phoenix. And I think that's kind of what entrepreneurship is, right? Is kind of continuing to grind through the grit, understanding that none of this is going to be easy and everything can be taken away in a heartbeat. But the, it's the grind that we aim for, right? The continuously evolving door of what's going to change next. How can we continuously improve? Because I think that's what truly human beings are at their best. 
is when they're innovating, is when they're actually mm -hmm. getting together, they're talking, they're creating ideas. I mean, look at what the pandemic did. Uh, if you really look at what the pandemic did and with the vaccine that they created, the the science and the perfect storm that went behind to create that really is quite unique. And so it really is kind of a unique perspective, you know, in the healthcare world to be able to have that perspective and get into the business world. How would you say... Um, do you do you see some similarities in healthcare and being an entrepreneur, or do you see some differentiations, or is it pretty different? I actually see a lot of similarities, particularly between science. Um, I'm actually going to pause us just for a minute. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. I'm so sorry. Very you good. said you edited. I realized, like, I'm in Wyoming, and it's very dry Super here. Super dry. I know. I was just in Phoenix. I think my lip my lip is bleeding. Yep. <laughs> You're good. Sorry. Okay. I suddenly was like, oh God, is it like running down my face? No, you're good. <laughs> Didn't even know. So sorry. It. Okay. Okay, great. Do you want to ask your question again? Or I can just hop in for your question. Yeah, go for it. Hop in. I'll edit it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, I do see some similarities, particularly between science and that kind of thinking. So when I did my PhD, it was like immunology. It was lab science. Uh, and But I see that the kind of thinking that my mentor pushed me to do like I would come in and say hey I'm gonna run this experiment and this experiment and he'd be like Carla why are you doing that like what not as a rhetorical question but right. like <laughs> what <laughs> what is it that you hope to learn why are you why do you want to know that why would it be important to know that would the field value that and so this idea, it's very similar to when an entrepreneur is like, I have this product. I want to make this product. It's always really important to ask, why is that the product? Like, what is it in the market that that does? Will the market value it in the same way that, um, sure, like there are lots of things we could like fix or this or that, but like really thinking about how valuable is that solution? How big is the problem in fact? And um I just see a lot of similarities between sort of the scientific method where you think through, you make a hypothesis, you try and figure out how to test it and how to keep moving forwards. Ideally, you know, lab stuff isn't cheap. So uh -huh. in, similarly, how do you test it as cheaply as possible? <laughs> and um, I think it's very similar to the sort of entrepreneurial loop of saying, okay, how do we, uh, have a hypothesis? How do we test it in the market? Maybe with an MVP, something, just get data, figure it out. Yeah. And um, so I think that part is really similar to science. I think the medicine piece, the biggest parallel I continue to think about is that like see, own and improve your choices. Mm, yeah. And I think this is such an empowering thing as an entrepreneur where you're making the choices. You don't have a boss who's making the choices for you. Um, but it's really important to see like, okay, I choose this over this. I choose this over this. There are trade-offs. Let's see how it goes. I'm going to learn from that. You know, at the end of the day, I'm responsible. And that's actually a very empowering place to be. Yeah, that's so, very true. And I can improve. You know, one of the things, yeah. I, you know, Carl, I'm sure you're very aware of this is they, it's kind of a pretty normal phrase in the surgical world, especially in the academic world is see one, do one, teach one, you know, and that's mm -hmm. very true in the entrepreneurship world as well as, you see something, right? And then you're going to go do it. You're going to test it either as a consumer or as a business owner. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to teach people how to use it or teach people the value of it, right? And that's, that's kind of where you kind of create. But to be honest with you, if you have to teach somebody too much of the value of something, then maybe it's probably not valuable, right? If, if, you're, yeah. if you're teaching too much, uh, the, 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 you might just be valuable to yourself. So just kind of be mindful <laughs> of that. Now, Carla, mm -hmm. how do you grow your brand? You know, you're, you're an executive coach. So how do you actually grow your brand? So, I mean, this is always a work in progress, right? Like you start and you're small and I started in Seattle and uh, primarily had clients who were local. I saw them in person and um, now I'm kind of in, I don't know, I always say like it's back to 2.0 or it's back to 3.0. <laughs> um, but I had, had moved even before the pandemic to this idea of working with clients remotely. So I had some people I saw in person, I was already doing some virtual coaching. And then the pandemic hit and I switched everyone to virtual coaching and then started really expanding kind of my reach nationally. And, um, you know, part, 
part of that is about the business, but the piece that I'm really embarking on now is about the ideas from the business because I love one-on-one -on -one coaching. I will probably always do some of that, but um, there is, you know, you can scale that so far. I have a, you know, limited, I have the same amount of time that everybody else yep. has. And so what's really important for me around impact is a little more about that brand and maybe even more so the ideas with the brand. So what are the principles of performance that really help people and that, you know, can land and have some value even without the one-on-one -on -one coaching to really personalize it and do that dialoguing? What is helpful to people? And, and that has much more scalability to it. And that excites me in terms of um, like where I'm going next and also just uh, how many people can I reach? And so, you know, in that sense, everyone I talk to, whether or not they choose to work with me as a coach, um, is a moment to really expand that brand. Um, and I take a good amount of time with all potential clients to just have that conversation. And, but there's also sort of, again, um, part of my brand is uh, being able to share some ideas on podcasts um, with gracious hosts like yourself and have great conversations about it. You know, not a lecture, but just really dialogue about what's useful. Yeah, it's very so. true. Mm -hmm. Now, what would you say, you've been working with some clients now for some time, what would you say are some either common questions that they're asking or maybe common mistakes mm -hmm. that they make? Great question. So we kind of talked a little bit about some to start, but uh, really um, I think most of us have either <laughs> a pile of stuff we got to do, or we have a dream. We have like a fantasy about some outcome that we want, but we don't necessarily have a plan or the way to connect the dots to get there. And so I think that points to this common mistake of not defining or asking ourselves, what do we want? What is the outcome we want? And there are a lot of reasons why this gets trained out of us. Like, you know, or we get the, I should want this, but I don't want that. So I just won't think about what I want. Or um, it, it's a practice that sometimes just sort of goes away for us. But it's really important because everything else flows then from there. So the second thing is that even if we say, okay, what do I want? And we actually kind of define that explicitly. We have to ask ourselves, what is actually most important to getting there? And I can use myself as an example. So I did no social media, no blogging, no social media, no content production for the first 10 years of my practice. And I think there were a lot of people early on who were like, oh, you should do a blog. You should do this. You should do that. And certainly plenty of coaches had blogs, had this. But I looked at really what was essential. And I said, what is essential is I need to continue to improve my method. Like people need to get value from it doesn't matter how great at marketing I am if I'm not actually producing something great for my customers. So that was number one. And number two, it was, you need to figure out how to um, talk about what you do and how to really build a sales pipeline to have clients. And that might never involve social media or online marketing. And um, so I really focused on those things. I really focused at learning sort of how to pitch, how to talk about my business, how to make it clear that it might address people's needs, the challenges they were facing. And um, so that's just using myself as an example, but there you can imagine all the things that I could have been doing that could have taken other time. But I really focused on those things and, um, and they, were, they were levers that could drive me in the direction that I wanted to go. And so it was effective. Um, so I think that is the first mistake is we don't really, again, brutally focus and say, whether it's a health goal, whether it's a business goal to say, what really is the driver towards that? And yeah. with the knowledge, there's going to be so many other things people are doing, so many things you think you should do or um, all of that. But to really actually say, what drives that? And how could I actually eliminate a lot of the other stuff? So I think that's one, that's probably my top, top mistake. There, there are others and I'm happy to talk about them, but I think that is the biggest one to drive home. Nice. Now, where, where do you see Thax in the next five years? That's a great question. I see it uh, having more of a footprint in this idea space. What do you want to call it? Thought leadership, 
whatever it is, because uh, I love the stuff that I'm working on with clients and the ideas have evolved and um, just uh, have grown and developed. And I think they're really useful. And I love um, being the spark that changes something for someone, whether they hear it on a podcast or they read it in an essay or something like that. So um, obviously my focus was not on that for the first 10 years. And I suspect there will be a lot more of that over the next 10 years. Nice. Now, what if for folks that are interested in learning more about you, maybe uh, learning more about Thaxa, how can they find Carla? How can they find Thaxa online? Are you on social yet? I'm on social. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> we, we're breaking news, baby. <laughs> Love it. Oh my gosh. Um, so great way to learn more about my coaching is at my website, Thaxa.com. That's T-H-A-X-A. And you can message me through this site, particularly if uh, you would like to have a conversation about what coaching might look like. I'm happy to talk a little more about my process um, and about people's goals for that. And um, so, but there's also just more information about my coaching in general. And um, for listeners of the podcast, one of the things I love to do is just whenever you're looking for a coach, sometimes that process can feel sort of ambiguous and like, how do I start? How do I find a good coach? Um, so I actually have a download that I created that's just about what are some of the common mistakes that can happen when you're looking for a coach and how to avoid them. So how to run nice. a good process, um, how to think about it, how to think about what you want out of coaching. Um, so I will put that up. We'll make sure the welcome page has that. Perfect. And then again, so for folks that are listening, you can also find this information on the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter. So please make sure to subscribe to the newsletter. It will also be on the blog post. So I'll make sure I'll have this information on the blog post. We'll also have the links on the website episode. So again, there's going to be a lot of information uh, on the on the websites. Now, what about your social channels? Should they, they, any social media locations they can find you? Yes. So LinkedIn is probably the best place. And that's at Carla dash Fowler. And so, um, you can follow me there. I, this is where I post like when I'm on a podcast, that's where that goes. And so it's a great place. Also, if you just want to hear more about performance science, like we talked a lot about business today, there's lots of interesting things. I love to talk about also just in other realms of performance. And so, um, and even in the nonprofit space. So, um, there's good stuff that you can find there. Awesome. Carla Fowler, the founder and managing director of Thaxa, elite executive coach. Thank you so much for attending, uh, being on the show. Really did have a, uh, appreciate the conversation. I'm telling you, I'm going to try to, I, I think I'm still going to try to get you to come back to surgery at some point. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a compliment. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, thank you again so much for being on the show. For those listening, you can follow me at the shades of E on all the social channels. You can also link up with me on LinkedIn at Mr. Gabriel Flores. Other than that, thank you for listening and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.